Thank you for joining us for another power-packed message provided by Monroe Global Incorporated and MonroeGlobal.com. We transform followers into leaders and leaders into agents of change. We hope that this message is a blessing to you as you advance your life and discover your purpose. Now, let's go into the message. Today, we're going to continue in our series on the kingdom of God, the kingdom series. But in this segment, we're going to deal with a topic that seems to be a little bit strange. Uh, we're going to talk about the church of the kingdom. It's a segment we're going to be dealing with today. The church of the kingdom. I want you to write it just like that in your notes. We're going to be dealing with rediscovering the original role and purpose of the church. Rediscovering the original role and purpose of the church. What's our topic today? Say it loud. One more time. The church of the kingdom. The church of the kingdom. Now I want to begin this session with a couple of comments to help you understand what the, the title of this session means. In the Bahamas, where I live, and in all former colonial colonies of Great Britain, whether it is Jamaica or Barbados or St. Vincent, whether it's Trinidad or Guyana or all the other nations that were under Britain, you will know that the British form of colonialism produced a system of parliamentary democracy and parliamentary government that establishes government in a certain structure. One of the most important aspects of parliamentary democracy in governmental structure, listen carefully, is the establishment of what the government calls ministries. It's very interesting that the British use this word to describe their government's execution of its administration. It establishes what? Ministries. So in the Bahamas, in Jamaica, in Barbados, in St. Kitts, in St. Vincent, the Grenadines, in Barbuda, all the way down to Trinidad and Guyana, and any other British colony, including India, which is formerly a British colony, they have what they call government ministries. Now, in the United States, which almost became a British colony, and they have what they call the revolution, they have the same thing except in America they don't call those ministries ministries in the United States they call them departments same thing so in the Bahamas we have a central government and that central government executes its administration as a government through an organized system called ministries so we have a ministry of education, a ministry of economics, a ministry of fisheries, a ministry of social services, a ministry of local government. We got all these different ministries. Now what they really are, they are structures that represent the central government's administration and they carry out the government's policies and mandates and the government's uh, programs in the country they are in. In the United States, they call them the, the Department of Education, the Department of Economic Development, the Department of Social Welfare. Same thing. What are those? They are simply organizational structures from the government that are set up 
by the government to execute the central federal government's programs for the society or the people or the citizenry or the kingdom. Now, I want you to read the topic of our session again. What is it? The Church of the Kingdom. What we really have is the government of the Bahamas or the United States or any other country execute their programs and administration through these ministries or departments. So the Department of Education in the United States or the Ministry of Education in the Bahamas is a ministry of the government. Is that clear? So that's a specific structure that is set apart and the government appoints what they call a secretary. In our country it's called a permanent secretary. In the United States it's called a secretary. The secretary of education. In the Bahamas it's called the permanent secretary of education. Same name. Now the, the responsibility of the secretary is to oversee the operation of that ministry or that department to make sure that what the central government's program intends to do is being done by that particular ministry or department. So they've been assigned by the government to carry out the government's program in that ministry or in that department. Now it's very interesting, follow me carefully, that no secretary of government is voted in. You don't vote for a permanent secretary in a country. They are appointed personally by who? Either the president or the prime minister, depending on which system you are in. All permanent secretaries are appointed by the head of the country. You don't vote them in. You vote in representatives, you vote in senators, whatever, they can be appointed, but you cannot really vote in a secretary. The secretary is chosen by the king, by the president, or by the prime minister, and they are set over that local department or ministry to carry out the government's programs for the citizens. Are you following me so far? Now, I want you to read the topic again of our session. What is it? The Church of the Kingdom. I think the church has misunderstood its role. <clears throat> That's why we got to talk about it. The Department of Education is not the government. Am I right? The Ministry of Health is not the government. But they are established to carry out government programs to make sure that the citizens receive what the government promised them. That's what a department is for. That's what a ministry is for. And so when we think about the kingdom of God, let's think about the kingdom, first of all, of the church. Uh, let's put it in your terminology here. The Department of Education is really a department of the government of the country. So the government is the government of the Ministry of Education. Am I right? The government is the government of the Department of Education. The government is really the one that establishes the ministry. So when God first set up the entire human program, when you read the book of Genesis chapter 1, you'll find that God says, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness, and he tells us why. For they will have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over everything that creeps upon the ground and over all the what? All the what? Earth. So what's on God's mind? God's mind is he created a planet called Earth and he's going to set up a department on Earth to run the Earth for him and he wants to have his dominion carried out on that planet by a structure called man. 
Mankind is God's uh, heavenly department responsible for executing heaven's government's programs on earth. Is that as simple as I can put it? Am I speaking English? Is there anyone in here, two years old, who don't understand what I just said? Don't, don't complicate the Bible. The Bible is very simple. God is the king. He has a government called the kingdom of God. He has a territory called heaven. God wants to extend his government to other realms. So he creates what he calls the visible realm. The visible realm includes the millions of stars and planets and galaxies and one of them by his own divine choice he chooses to become an outpost of heaven. Does that word make sense? He wants to set up a territory outside of heaven that receives his heavenly government's influence and has his government's colony on it. And he establishes this planet and then in Genesis 1 verse 26, God tells us how he wants to operate his government on that planet. How does he do it? He says, look at verse 1 of Genesis. Verse 1 is very interesting. And God created the heavens and the earth. Notice the word heavens is plural. In other words, all of the galaxies and planets and Milky Ways and all the beauty of space, the scientists so far have discovered 500 million galaxies. That's a lot of places. Now look at the next statement. The heavens and the earth. Now earth is what? Singular. Heavens is plural, which means he created all the stars and all the planets you see, but he also comes right down to one. He says, and I created the one of them that is called earth. Okay, look at verse 26. Then God said, let us make man. So now he's setting up his structure, his ministry, his department to run this planet. Read it. Let us make man. Man is a, it's a Hebrew word, ish. And it's a plural word. I keep reminding myself of that because I keep thinking. Sometimes we forget. The word man is a plural word. Man is referring to an entire species. Let us make man a species, an entire structure, an entire group of species, of beings. We will call them man, and he tells us why he's making them. Why? Let them have our image and our likeness. We know what that means by now. Image means spirit, nature, and character. This structure, these, this species will be just like me, God says. They will have my nature and my characteristics. And then he says, they will have my likeness. The word likeness means they will function like me. Doesn't mean they look like me physically. They will function like me. That Hebrew word actually means to function like. So they will have my nature, my character. They will function like me. So if you want to know how you're supposed to function, you've got to study God. Continue to read verse 26. He says, now here's why I made them. No guessing. Let them have dominion. Some translation says rulership uh, over the fish on that planet, the birds on that planet, the cattle on that planet, and the whole earth. See that third, that fourth statement there? The whole earth, the whole planet. And then the last statement says, and over everything that creeps upon the ground. And verse 27 it says, so God created man. So he planned it, then he did it. He made them in two models, male and female models, right there in verse 27. And then he repeats himself. And God blessed them and said, here's how to dominate the place. Be fruitful, be productive, multiply, that means reproduce yourself, whatever you produce, reproduce it. 
replenish, that means distribute yourself and subdue, take control over the planet. And then the last statement says, and have dominion. That's how you do it. So, what is God after? Now, now I'm going to make a statement here that's going to be a little heavy. You got to listen carefully. Please listen carefully. God started the human race as church. Just write that down. Uh, that'll make sense in a minute. God did not begin the church 2,000 years ago. Adam was church. Write it down. Adam was ecclesia. God did not begin the human race with some sinners and then chose a few from among them and made them church. God did not begin with sinners. God only chose one group of people in history. One. And it was not Jews. It was man. God only created one race on the planet. And it had nothing to do with color. Let us make what? Man. The only race that God created was man. God did not create Jews, Gentiles, black, white, pink, and yellow. God created one race. He calls it man. So church was the first thing God set up on planet Earth as the department responsible for execution of his government's programs on planet Earth. It's called dominating territory for God. Ruling the Earth for God is man's number one responsibility. So the original and ultimate goal of God for man was to establish his heavenly kingdom on earth. His goal was for man to do that for him. Can I hear an amen? There are no two departments of education in any country. It causes confusion. God never contradicts himself. Never does. Never. I don't care what the theologians and the critics may say about scripture, God will never contradict himself. As a matter of fact, that's why the Holy Ghost and Jesus will never be on earth at the same time. Did you know that? Christ says, if I don't go, he can't come. God never confuses himself. Count two of us and then both of us talking to you and then saying two different things. No, 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 no. One of us can be here and that's who's speaking. You can't have two secretaries of education. These are simple things I'm saying. There's only one ghost on this planet. <laughs> now, when you tell me you hear from God, boy, that better line up with what God's word says. God doesn't contradict himself. So you cannot say the Lord led me to rob a bank. When God says thou shalt not steal. So you can't tell me God told you to do something if it contradicts his word. So Jesus came to earth to do something. Follow me. When the first man was created, everybody say man. What is man? Plural. When the first department was set up, God said to that department, and the permanent secretary. 
He says, you run this department for me, dominate this planet for me, execute my judgment on this planet, and you represent my government here, and you carry out my dictates just like I command you. And do not break relationship with the government. Don't touch that tree. Don't destroy the connection. Don't uproot the, the, the telephone lines. Don't cut off connection with the government. Otherwise, you will have no way of knowing what I want. You will surely die. That was really the instruction. Stay in touch with the government. Well, you know what happened in chapter 3. What happens? Well, an unemployed cherub came to visit. He had a discussion with the department. The department of Dominion. He got somehow to talk to the secretary. The assistant secretary. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. And he convinced the assistant secretary to violate the government's regulations. She went into the permanent secretary and convinced him to violate government regulation. And the government made a promise that the government keeps. Now, one with this government, it cannot lie. Once this government tells you something, it will carry out its dictates. And the government says, the day you violate my regulation, I will cut off relationship with the department. By the way, write the word sin down again. I want you to get this word right. Because the word sin has become so muddy. Sin does not mean to lie, to steal, to curse, to commit adultery, to, to, to backbite. All them stuff we call sin. That's not what sin means. All these things are manifestations of sin. They are not sin. The word sin, as used in the scriptures, means, write it down, rebellion against the authority of God. That's what the word means. It means rebellion against the will of God. Will means what? Intention. So when a man or woman say they sin, when God says you sin, he's saying that you are rebelling against the government's will. So when Adam and Eve disobey God, God says, you, I call this rebellion against my government. That's what sin is. Uh, when you talk about the death of Jesus, the sacrifice of Jesus, if you study the Bible carefully, I know you're good students, you will find that the word, when it, when it refers to his death, it has a singular word, sin. He died for the sin of the world. The rebellious spirit against government's authority. He died for this spirit that is antagonistic against God's rulership on earth in your life. So he died. And so Adam, the permanent secretary, and the assistant secretary lost contact with the government. Now the problem is they're still in the territory. And the department still there. The only problem is they don't know what the government wants. So they start guessing. Sounds like you, right? Hope this work, hope that work, hope this is the right person to marry in. Hope this is the right job. I hope we're doing this thing. I hope. And we keep hoping all our ways to hell. We even hope we find God. So we try to hopefully use our religious activities. Hope we get back in touch. So religion is really man's attempt to try and reconnect with government of heaven. Can I repeat this? Religion is man's attempt to attempt to reconnect with the government of heaven. That's why religion is a reaching up. We offer sacrifices. We, we go through all kind of traditions. We go through rituals. And in every culture around the world, believe me, they all got their cultural traditions trying to find some greater authority. And they, got, they, they invent religion. But what's so incredible about this man, Jesus? is that he reversed the whole process. He says, for God so loved the department <laughs> that he 
that he didn't ask the department to try and reach him. Oh boy. That's a good place to say thank you, Jesus. I mean, God saw us in our mess. He said, look, I know you can't reach me. So all your works is as filthy rags in my sight. Everything you attempt to get back in touch with my government is useless. So I'll tell you what, because I love the department so much, I will send myself to reconnect you to the department. Do you know what man is without God? Man is a ruler without authority. It's a good thing to write down. A man, a human without God is a ruler without authority. What's authority? It's from the word authorization. A human without God is unauthorized rulership. It's not authorized. He's not, you know, uh, <laughs> some of you who work for government, whether in America or in the Bahamas or Jamaica or Trinidad or Barbados or wherever you work, if you work for a government, you know, if you work for a department, the permanent secretary can't really do anything without the government's okay. Come on, talk to me. Matter of fact, nothing can get a permanent secretary fired faster than contradicting the minister. Are you going with me? Here. So the Holy Ghost will never disagree with Jesus. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Matter of fact, Jesus said when he comes, he will not speak anything of himself. He will only say what I tell him to say. Why? He works with a government. <laughs> so here we see a department with out connection to the government still operating it's called fallen man now therefore what did earth lose earth lost the influence of the government of heaven on earth that's what it lost it lost the king's dominion on earth it lost the king dominion the kingdom of heaven on earth that's what they lost so we are a department without connection so when when God sends <laughs> when God sends or comes himself in the flesh called Christ what do you think he comes to do answer me I like the word, you're getting it. What, is he, what does he come to do? Christ didn't come to start a religion. He meant a lot of that here. His goal was not to start some buildings with some steeples and some bells and some stained glass windows and some chairs and some pulpits and some choirs and, and all the stuff we get involved in. He didn't come in and start with no candles and no incense and no prayer meetings. And, no, he didn't come to do that. He came to do one simple thing. He came to re-establish, reconnect, restore, revive, reconcile man back to God. Is that simple enough? So what did he bring? He brought the government of God back to earth. He brought the king's dominion back to earth. Let's read what he says here in Luke chapter 4 verse 42. Very familiar verse. We've been working with this for a while. But I want you to see it again in the context of the department. Verse 42. But he said, Jesus is speaking, I must preach the good news. Boy, that must be good news, eh? You ain't got to hope nothing work anymore. You ain't got to guess about life anymore. He said, the good news is, I have come to bring you a reconnection. Read it. I come to preach the good news of what? The kingdom of God to the other towns also. Next statement. Because this is why I came. End quote. There's no question about why I'm here. We think he came to die on the cross. That is not really his purpose. The cross 
was a means to an end. Let me tell you what the cross is. Let's simplify the cross. Can you simplify the cross? Well, let's see. What caused Adam to cut off relationship with the, with the government? What? Sin. Sin. What does God require for sin? Well, sin is what? He said, the day you eat, you will surely die. Okay, so the result of sin is what? Death. Okay, death. Now, so that means every human, every man deserves death. God has to make sure that he keeps his word. So God has to make sure all man die or something got to die that satisfies God. So what God decides, instead of all of you dying, I'm going to create one man and he'll die. So we can get the death satisfied, get that solved. So he sends himself in a man's body and then kills himself. Now, no Jew killed him. No Gentile killed, no Roman soldier killed Jesus. That's very clear. Matter of fact, he keeps repeating it. No man takes my life. He, I, you know, Isaiah said so clearly. He says, he was smitten of God. So God killed himself so he don't have to kill you. Praise the Lord. Can you just praise him? Can you just go ahead and praise him for a second? Wow. Make me want to shout. He killed himself to satisfy his own judgment. Now watch this. So he satisfied himself. Now, so the death on the cross was to take care of what was stopping the reconnection. So the death was not the goal. Okay, let me try it this way. Let me try it this way. Give you a good, this is a good example. Here you have a, a toaster, a fan, uh, a VCR, whatever, a refrigerator. And this thing is running good. I mean, the fan is cooling, the toaster working, VCR running. And then what happens? Somebody pulled the plug out. Watch this. What happens? It shuts down. Does it still exist? Yes. Can it still work? Yes. Is a component still in it? Yes. Is the potential still present? Yes. Do you want to benefit from it? Yes. Can you? Yeah. No. Why? Disconnection. Now, if you call me as a specialist to come in and put the plug back in, my question to you is, is putting the plug back in the ultimate goal? Okay, important question. Well, what do you think? Some of you are saying yes. Let me check you out. Okay. You have a VCR. You got videos to play. But the plug is out. You call me to put the plug in. What is your ultimate goal? What? To watch the movie. To watch the movie not to put the plug in. <laughs> you, you, you can get it later. See, we worship the plug. Oh, thank God the plug is in. For years we worship the plug and never play the movie. <laughs> we camp around the, the socket. We spend years preaching on the socket, a beautiful socket, a lovely plug, a powerful plug, an awesome plug. Thank God for the plug. God, just sit down and put the movie in. Leave the plug and go enjoy your movie. Calvary was God turning to earth to put the plug back in, to reconnect us once again to the government of God so we could what? execute administration dominion on the earth so Jesus says what I came to do what to preach the kingdom of God he said that is why I came I didn't come for the cross boy this gets heavy now the cross is quite necessary you can't operate moving without electricity don't get me wrong but the electricity is a means to the end of watching the movie. Do you know what religion has done? Religion gets you reconnected and let you spend the last 50 years of your life talking about how sweet the connection is. 
Never watch a movie. <laughs> Never eat toast bread. <laughs> Starving to death and saying I'm connected. And listen, the toaster working baby, go get the bread and eat some toast bread. Can I hear an amen, somebody? <laughs> Tell you how wonderful this toast is. I don't know what toast is. Is it working? And can we eat some bread? He that gave us Christ, how would he not also with him give us all things, Paul says. Not just giving you Christ. He's the technician. He comes to put the plug in. But also everything that comes with that reconnection, he says, is yours. Hallelujah. Some of you are getting it. Tell your neighbor, I want the whole thing. Lift your hands and thank God for, for the reconnection. Now I'm going to watch some movies. And all of them are about me. And I'm the star. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to watch my movies before I die. I tell you. Anybody got any movies in the head? Do you see the house you want to live in? And that business you want to own? And that marriage you dream about? And, yeah, the movies you're okay. He wants you to enjoy everything you're dreaming about gives you visions in the night the next statement Luke 12 verse 32 do not be afraid little flock Christ is speaking again for your father has been pleased to give you not religion but the kingdom that's why he came the father has been pleased to what give you the kingdom the word please is from the word pleasure. God's pleasure. He gets pleasure when you start dominating again. When you start taking control of your circumstances. When you start not being a victim anymore of your environment and people and opinions and situations. When you take charge of life, God says, ah, that's my baby. Look at my boy. I mean, you know, that's he gets excited. As a matter of fact, there's a little hint about this, the pleasure. Eh? The Bible doesn't speak of Christ laughing too often. Did you know that? But let me tell you where the Bible talks about him laughing. I mean, actually, he wasn't just laughing. The word is used, which implies that he was leaping around ecstatically. And the word in the Greek language actually implies to be clamorously foolish. I want you to imagine the holy Jesus, as you call him, leaping around wildly. Yes! Wow! That's what the word means. It means he was jumping up and leaping and screaming and excited. Guess where that word is used about him? The Bible says, he sent them out two by two. Gave them authority, authorization to cast out demons, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the leper, and to preach the kingdom gospel to the villagers. They went out, they met demons, wiped them out meant sickness, cleansed them. He meant demons, cast them out. And the Bible says they came back later to him and said, Master, guess what? We healed the sick. We did it. We raised the dead. We cast out demons. We took authority over circumstances. Every demon that met us had to leave. Every sickness we touched had to leave. My God, Jesus, you just have been there. And the Bible says, and in that moment, Jesus rejoiced. The word rejoice. Joyce means to jump. In case you don't know. Rejoice means to keep doing it. Keep doing it over and over again. Why did he get so excited? Because he finally saw man no longer a victim of circumstances. God gets excited when you walk in there and make your last mortgage payment. You all ain't ready yet. God says, yes, that's my girl. Paid off in two years instead of ten. Say amen, son. Say, that's me. Claim that. Claim that quick. That's the word he came in my Claim it. Claim it. Claim it. Say, that's me. Say, pay it off. off. Man, God gets excited when you get healed. If you're sick today in this room, I'm telling you, you say, God, I want to make you excited. Give me the kingdom department of health. Oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you're stupid, sorry, if you are ignorant in the Bahamas, 
The government's reputation is tarnished by illiteracy. That's why the government spends so much millions of dollars in education. Why? Because when the people are stupid, it reflects on the government. So the government says, I can't have you stupid. So the government builds these billions of dollars worth of schools and teachers and equipment and material and resources and everything and then makes it mandatory for you to go to the school. And if you come out, they catch you and put you back. I mean, the government says, look, you, I can't have you stupid. Y'all talk to me, man. I, that's how government works. The department is to make sure the government looks good. So if you are sick today, there's a department called the Department of Health. Lift your hands and say, Lord, I come to get what's mine. Now, if you're sick, thank him right now for healing. Let's just reclaim it. Take it from the department. The Bible says, you are healed by the stripes provided by the permanent secretary. Healing is not a suggestion from God. If you are a citizen of your country and you have a child, the government cannot refuse that child education. It is called a right. Hallelujah. Healing is your right. I say healing is your right. You all to get this thing. The, the, the devil can't tell you, you you ain't qualified. Listen, not only am I qualified, the government qualified me. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> There's nothing that you can accuse me of that holds. He says that no man can accuse me. They that walk in the spirit, it says there's now no for, therefore no condemnation. Can you just use your faith a little bit? Whatever wrong in your body, you might not even know what it is. Say it right now. I have a right to this. I am healed now. Come on, pull it down. I am healed now in the name of the King, Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord, somebody. Clap your hands and worship him. You take it as a right. I say as a right, Brother Cartwright. It ain't no suggestion. And that's why religion will make you comfortable in your sickness. Kingdom don't tolerate it. You have a right to be healed. You have a right to be educated. You have a right to have social welfare. I said social welfare. You know what commonwealth means? You all don't think sometimes. <laughs> the Bible actually uses the word. We are members of the commonwealth of the household of God. Common wealth. I supposed to be blessed more than you. There's something you ain't taking, that's all. Come on, shout amen, somebody. I mean, the fella in the pig pen was still a son. His robe was where? In the closet. Slippers where? In the closet. Ring where? On the table. Still his. What are you eating? Hog food. It's a choice. What was his response? He was a religious man. Religious says, I just want to be a servant of the Lord. I just happy to be in the house, mopping the floor, washing dishes. The father says, mm -mm, you ain't no servant. My son, who was lost. See, a servant has no rights, but a son has an inheritance. The kingdom of God is about your restoration to your rights in God. Let's take a look at something here. The kingdom and the church. Let's talk about the difference. First of all, 
this is a confusing thing for most people. They're not sure what the kingdom is. They ain't sure what the church. Matter of fact, the church think it's the kingdom. The church is not the kingdom of God. The Department of Education is not the government. Got it? Uh, are you all okay? Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my father, those are many mentions. Bless you, amen. Okay, watch this. Read out loud for me. The church and the kingdom are not synonymous. Please write that down. I want to share something with you very, very tantalizing in your spirit. Here it is. Because you are a member of the church doesn't mean you would experience the kingdom. You know, <laughs> being employed by the ministry of vacation doesn't make you the government. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? You work for the Department of Education doesn't mean you are the government. The church is not synonymous with the kingdom. Second point. The kingdom existed before the church. As we know it. As we know the church. The kingdom existed before the church. Let's refer to that scripture there please. Turn to Matthew 25. Matthew chapter 25 verse 34. I want you to read this. Let's see how long the kingdom existed. The kingdom existed before the church. Matter of fact, the kingdom is called what? The kingdom of God. How long did God exist? Long before man. So, <laughs> the church is what? God's department of humanity to operate his government on the planet. God existed before. Let's read it. You got it? What does it say? Read it for me out loud. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come ye who are blessed of my father, take your inheritance. Look at that word inheritance. What is it? The kingdom which was prepared for you. How long? Before the creation of the world. The kingdom existed before the earth. So the, the church cannot be the kingdom. You all notice every time a, a new government comes in, the departments get nervous. You all notice that. Every time a new government comes in, all the departments get nervous. Why? Because now you got a new authority in place and they begin to change people they want to change. They take away permanent secretaries. They move this and move that. <laughs> Sometimes they call it victimization. <laughs> now the devil got a lot of that going on in his kingdom. The kingdom of God existed before the church. The government exists before the education department. It creates the department. It produces it. It establishes it. It comes out of the government. So when we talk about the church, we got to be careful. Point number three. The key to the kingdom was the influence of heaven on earth by the Holy Spirit through the agency of mankind. I want you to write that whole sentence down. Very important sentence. The key to the kingdom was the influence of heaven on earth through the Holy Spirit. Through the agency of man. I want you to underline the word agency. Mankind is an agency of heaven. The key to this thing is the, the Holy Spirit. Who's the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is the plug between the fan and the electrical company. 
if you take the plug out, there's no connection. When Adam disobeyed God, the plug left. So the most important person on earth today is not the Pope. It's not Maharaja Selassie, Muhammad, etc. The most important person on earth is not your mother, father, or your boss. The most important person on earth is not your wife, your husband, or your boyfriend, or your fiance. You better hear this. The most important person on earth is an invisible person. They are real. He is a he, not an it. Christ is when he, the spirit of truth comes. He will guide you, reconnect you into all truth. The ultimate goal of Jesus is very simple. Coming to earth was to get the Holy Spirit back inside a human being. No big deal about the mystery. Matter of fact, when he went to the cross, died, his last words were, it is finished. We thought that was his last words. That's not true. That's the last words on the cross. The last words of Jesus were strange words. He had two of them. One, this was after the resurrection. Receive the Holy Ghost. His last, last word is in Acts chapter 1. Who was it about? Who was the word about? It wasn't about Calvary. It wasn't about no blood. It wasn't about no resurrection. It was about this person. He says, you stay here in Jerusalem, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. He said, what you're missing is the ghost that brings the power. Can I hear an amen? Let me tell you, that is why religion is such a danger. Because religion doesn't guarantee the Holy Ghost. Nikki, you all know Nikki? Yeah, Nikki Demas. Nikki was a faithful religious leader in the synagogue. The man was in charge. Christ says, you ain't connected. He was in charge of prayer. He was in charge of the program. He was in charge of the service. This guy, the Bible says, a leader of the synagogue. He wore the right robes, had the turban, had the breastplate. The guy was decked out in collar backwards and everything. And yet, he came to Christ, and Christ says, you know something? You still ain't in the kingdom. He said, how can I get in? He said, let me tell you how to get in. Except a man be born again of the Spirit. He cannot even enter the kingdom of God. Nicky says, how can I do that? I'm a man. He says, you see, you're even stupid. <laughs> he says, except you be born of the Spirit, you cannot see, understand the government of God. It connects by the Holy Spirit. If you got the Holy Spirit, lift your hands and thank Him for the Holy Spirit. And if you ain't got him, you better lift your hand up right now and say, Lord, I receive it right now in Jesus' name. Jesus came to give you the Holy Spirit, brother. Young man, young woman, children, God gave you the Holy Spirit. It's free. He says, the Father's pleasure to give you the Holy Spirit. If a man has a child, he says, and he asks this child, if a child asks him for, for, for an egg, will he give him a snake? If he asks for bread, will he give him a stone? How much more will your heavenly Father give you? Specifically, the Holy Spirit, he says. What is the kingdom? The kingdom of God is love, joy, peace, righteousness. Where? In the Holy Spirit. It ain't no religion. Don't ignore the Holy Spirit when he talks to you today, tomorrow. 
the next day on your job, when you're on the bus, when you're driving in traffic. The kingdom is always active. Listen to him. He tells you what corner not to go through, how to stop, where to go to take another route today. I mean, he tells you, you got to listen to him. Why? He knows the administration. Sometimes he tells you, bake a cake and take it to somebody. So he tells you, don't, 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 take that money, give it to somebody else. You listen to the government. The government knows what's going on. Thank God for the Holy Spirit, young woman. Holy Spirit wants to guide you every day. He's our authority. And that's how the kingdom works. Look at this next point. Very important point. The fall of man caused the departure of the Holy Spirit. So the spirit of man lost the spirit of God. And thus, the loss of the kingdom influence of heaven on earth was lost. That, that's simple, eh? You can't represent someone you ain't in touch with. <laughs> so you invent your own uh, representation. So a sinner man is a man representing himself. <laughs> that's why you can't trust a man without God. He, he represents himself. And you know, anyone other than themselves, they can keep lying to keep themselves looking good. It's like a man getting over with a girl. You know, you never believe one another. Believe me. Don't believe a person who, who said they love you. You know, they, 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 you're, you're going steady. You ain't steady. You shaky, shaky. Every day they tell you, mm -mm, they protect in their image okay, before you. That's why you never see them in rollers looking ugly. They're always looking pretty all the time. Courtship is a dangerous thing. You know what I'm talking about. Courtship people never look bad, never look dirty, never look smell steak. They always look nice. But once they caught you, <laughs> boy, them foot smell bad, bad breath, ugly face in the morning. Have mercy, Jesus. That's the real truth now coming out, see? <laughs> A man without the Spirit of God is representing himself. And that's why he lies. Let God be true. And every man a lie. Always lie. I love you, baby. What do you mean you love me? The Bible says, if a man hath not God, he hath not love. Now, I don't know how I can spell it in English, make it simple for you. Can I speak in English a little bit more? If a man doesn't have God, he knoweth not love. That's what the scriptures teach. So I don't care how cool the brethren looks. Jerry curls, pants down on his hip, cool as a cucumber, Camaro car, brand new, everything, he say he love you. Ask him, you got the Holy Ghost? No, you don't love me, you lying. You're trying to protect yourself, you're representing yourself. You can't love me. Can I hear an amen? amen? I mean, some of them who got the Holy Ghost even got in trouble loving me. You're talking about them who ain't got it at all. God said, working with them. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. We lost the Holy Spirit. What did I make it to wrap up? Oh, Lord. Anyhow, uh, let me just give you this. This concept of this, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. What's the difference? The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. I wanted to go over this quickly with you because you, in the Bible you've read these two statements and sometimes they confuse you. Sometimes Christ would say the kingdom of heaven and then other times he would use the kingdom of God. So are they the same? Are they different? And sometimes it becomes a question. So I wanted to clear this up. Okay. Uh, let me see if I could use an example that you can understand. In the Bahamas and in America and in Jamaica, etc., they have what they call local governments, don't they? Yeah, got local governments in the Bahamas. In America, they call them state governments. So you got a central government, a federal government, you got a state government. In the Bahamas, you got a central government, then you got local governments in different areas. Now, the kingdom of God is the central government in the person of God. 
the kingdom of heaven is the location of the central government so in the Bahamas we would say that the government is in Nassau so it is the government of the Bahamas and the Bahamas is represented by the capital the capital is what gives the government its identity it's the central place of the government's power in the Bahamas it is Nassau in the United States it is what Washington now if you listen to the news today I want you to go home turn the news on and understand the kingdom when the newscasters are giving the news and they want to say what the government is saying they would simply say Washington says you ever heard that yeah in the Bahamas they simply say the government says now those two statements are referring to the kingdom of God the kingdom of heaven is referring to the place so the kingdom of heaven is referring to Washington so when you say use the word Washington you are talking about what a whole lot of power a lot of authority a lot of people the Congress and the Senate and all the you know judiciary got all that is the Washington so it's in one word Washington when God says the kingdom of heaven he's talking about all the powers the four and twenty elders all the authority in heaven all the cherubims and seraphims when God said the kingdom of heaven has come unto you he's telling you everything in the headquarters is now available to you I'm about to shout all by myself again. matter of fact when it says Washington says listen brother that's a big word it means the army, the Pentagon, the, 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 the Congress, the Senate, everyone's talking now. The, the, the Oval Office. And God tells you, the kingdom of heaven has come unto you. It's time for you to go to sleep and relax. That means everything in the headquarters is working on your behalf. Hallelujah. Can you, can, can you think about some problems you can't lift your hand? Just think about them and say, The kingdom of heaven has come to my house. Just worship him for a second. Just worship him for that. Just, man, the entire government of God is working on your behalf. Jesus was setting up the department. Oh, this is too much. He was on earth setting up the department. And the citizens got a little bit troubled. So he made a statement. It was a political statement. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Watch this now. He says, here's why not to be troubled. If you believe in the government, believe also in me. <laughs> you missed it. He said, look, the territory is covered by the government. Still ain't got it. He was getting ready to go away. He said, going away is not a big deal. The government is overseeing any movements of secretaries. The government's still in charge. So if I go or stay, it doesn't matter. You're safe. The whole government of heaven is still in charge of you you are under that government's jurisdiction how can you worry what you will eat what you will drink what you will wear how you will live the father knows you need these things so seek ye first the kingdom of heaven is a domain of heaven where the king, who is God, himself rules and reigns. I want you to get these two separate in your mind. He exercises authority and power over that territory. So when you see the words kingdom of heaven in scripture, Christ is referring to the place where God has total control. Matthew 4, 17, his first statements publicly. Repent, for the king of heaven has arrived. His first public statement. 
He didn't say the kingdom of God, you know. He said the kingdom of heaven has arrived. In other words, everything that is in that place has come to this place. <laughs> Washington has come to Miami. Heaven has come to earth. What a wonder. What is the kingdom of God? Let's wrap it up on this. The kingdom of God is any domain where the kingdom of heaven has influence and authority that's in effect. Okay, local government. Local government, state government. <laughs> All right, September 11th, let's see how it works in the kingdom. September 11th is a date we all will remember for the rest of our lives. Washington says, no longer will we allow the states to provide security for the airport. Washington shall take over this responsibility now, and we will affect our influence in every state. Now, previously we allowed the state to do it. Watch this. But it, it didn't say President Bush, it said Washington has decided that they will now man all airports, all ship and cargo ports, they will now man all borders, they will take over security. That means they have overruled the state in authority. Watch God now. Hallelujah. You see, Washington doesn't leave Washington to run the airport in Miami. Let me stand up here because I'm getting to the close now. <laughs> Washington stays in Washington. But Washington says... <laughs>
Let me tell you something. Before you are born again, you are under state rulership. Your own rulership. So you got to pay your own bills, heal your own body, prepare your own problems, solve your own issues, deal with life by yourself. But then I heard the state government of heaven say, the, set, the central government says, come unto me. All of you who are heavy laden, all these problems, and I will give you rest. Take my authority upon you. For my authority is easy to live with. And my burden, mm, no problem. His light, rejoice in the Lord. Always. And again I say, rejoice. For my God shall supply your needs according to, not yours, but the central government's riches in glory. Shout somebody. I got to stop right here. I got a lot more to talk about, but we praise the Lord some other time. Thank you once again for listening to this message as we hope that it has been a blessing to you. Our goal is to show you new paths and opportunities so that you can discover your purpose. It is your love, support, and partnership that makes Monroe Global possible. Please visit us online at www.monroeglobal.com for more product, partnership, or to join us at one of our live events around the world.